Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, and theater. And I'm so, so thrilled today to be talking to the fantastically talented Taylor Page, who's currently starring in the Netflix film, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And I wanted to start by asking you about auditioning for the role, because when you're usually auditioning for a part, you often have very scant details in terms of what you actually know about the character, what, right. you know, really just having the elements of one scene to construct who you think they would be but with this obviously there's August Wilson's source material so was was it a different process in terms of how much you were actually able to build out and construct a lot of different layers even just walking into the audition room for this yeah I mean it's rare because you especially if you're not you don't know the director you don't know the writer like I do feel like beyond I mean well August is he's prolific he's a prophet but beyond feeling like I I I read him. I I love him, but I think that he, if I were to flip it, I feel like he knows us. Like he knows our people. He's felt it. He's been angry, and his writing was kind of I think in resistance to and in protest of, and like the spirit of it is there. So then, and then on top of that, these people existed in the 1920s. So then I just took the atmosphere. The uh -huh. we're in the 1920s, like you know, 10 years before, it's like right now in 2020, this is such a specific time, you know, years from now we'll go 2020 COVID, like 2020 in, in the 1920s, mm -hmm. you're, we're in a rate, like a, it's heavily racial, mm -hmm. polarized, painful, heavy. And um, so there was, there's already so much fabric in there that like is really kind of there and available to you. And I just kind of thought about, I'm a black woman. Like I, all, I already, I feel like so much of that already lives in me because mm -hmm. I think, I mean, me being alive right now, still, I have these moments where I'm just living in the world and then other moments where I'm like, wow, I'm really alive right now. Like mm -hmm. I can dream really big. I like, mm -hmm. people are having conversations about things from so long ago and finally acknowledging and some aren't, but even just to, it's just, so it's the, the atmosphere is very much was, it was already there. So I was, this was a lucky, uh, lucky is maybe not the right word, but a very, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of, source and spirit already there with mm -hmm. everything else. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and with you mentioning the specificity of the 1920s, I thought it was interesting that you've also talked about how you didn't just think about the exact time period where it takes place, but you were thinking about what was happening politically and culturally five years before and 10 years before. So what were some of the added layers that you really discovered in terms of your character, Desi, but also, you know, that yeah. really helped you with the overall story as well from, from, traveling back in terms of your research and thinking about the time period that came just before this as well. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it would be for me, I felt, I, I feel like I'd be lying or I'd be ignorant not to like, I think to me, being a woman, being black is to be constantly gaslit in this world, mm -hmm. in your relationships, in your, in out there, in here, someone's not really understanding all that you're internalizing. Cause they, it's almost like, it's just, you've been expected. You take care of it. You keep your mouth closed. You take care of the family, you nurture, you've been raising other people's babies. Like that's just, and to, and, but so I, and, and, you know, you're constantly, I think it's which one came for, you know, I think uh, like, I'm, I feel like my words are, my words aren't catching up to how fast my brain is going because I have so much to say about this topic, but it's like, we are the descendants of slaves. Like we are miracles to be able to open our eyes and put one foot in front of the other and hope for something better to just hope that maybe if I, if I, if I go up North, there will be a possibility and I can raise my family and my children and I can have a better life than my great grandparents or my grandparents or my parents. But I was like, my people were like owned, mm -hmm. like that's crazy, you know? And like, I'm a woman and no one gives a damn about my opinion, but to have agency is so, it's such a, to be able to have agency among all of these conditions in this conditionally BS ass world, it's like, you know, it was crazy. So I just, 
I just thought about like my posture, how I would hold my body, how I would overcompensate, how I would respond. Like, mm -hmm. I think women today, today we know it, but even back then it's like consciousness was where it was. So I think you're like, today we hear like, why are you so angry? Or why are you saying it like that? Or she's so masculine or she's so blah, blah, blah. But yet we're forgetting like the, the glaring BS in the room, like, racism patriarchy capitalism like like this low vibrating loop that we've been on that's ingrained and embedded in all of our consciousness so how couldn't how wouldn't that affect us and how wouldn't that really affect the most marginalized people which are black and then women yeah and when you look at your character in the film as well she's really someone who is you know trying to pursue having agency she just wants people to look at her and to have some autonomy within the room. And, and the fact that she doesn't even interact with and have conversations with every single person who's in that room kind of says so much. And there's so many moments where you're very much kind of standing at the edge of the room and really just observing and, and watching what's going on and, and waiting to be invited into the circle. How did that cause a different type of approach in terms of the way that you were thinking about this character, particularly because, you know, to your point of like the internalization, there's so much that happens with your character in this film between the lines of the script. Right. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. And, and yeah, that's, it's, that's true. There's a lot going on that's unsaid. Honestly, I played, I thought of Desi as someone who's, all of them are so deeply wounded, but it manifests in their bodies differently. Thinks Desi realized my power is in my womb or in my, like, in my sexuality and owning it, or at least pretending to. But I think also, it's really like a means of survival, you know? It's like, if there was, if there's any answer or any, any like small bit of certainty or stability, or just, I wanna prove to all of you that I'm worthy of being here, that I'm not disposable. So maybe if I just sing it right or say it right, or, you know, I have myself together, I, I, I do the best that I can to keep it together to do as Ma says. And then if it's not going well with Ma, I see if there's maybe another window here with Levy, but it's like, I think it really, when you think about people and their motivations and just how complicated we all are, I think at the, at the root, at, at our purest, we all just want to be loved. We all just want to be, we all just want to feel like we love, we are loved, that we're safe. And, and usually I think a lot of our motives are based on a on love or lack of it. And it just manifests in people differently. Overcompensating, being an asshole, being unempathetic. It just feels to me like a lack of love. So I feel like Dusty was just like, okay, I see two opportunities for that. And maybe if I just do this, I'll be closer to that. And I just think that she was just like, she didn't really have any direction, but she just was, she knew she didn't want to go back there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that intimacy and, and love that exists between her and Ma is so interesting to watch between the performance with you and Viola Davis in those scenes, you know, particularly looking at that early scene where they first come into the recording studio and kind of without saying a word, like you take her shoe off, you rub her leg, and then you just kind of, there's like a subservience to the way that she just kind of like quietly then sits on the floor. So even the levels of the two of them are physically yep. different. So how did you and Viola work out the choreography of that scene and, and how you could convey so much about their dynamic and their really unique intimacy with each other in that moment? Um, well, I, I have to give it all to George who mm -hmm. thinks of every single detail and doesn't let one ounce of minutia get lost or not talked about or not thought about or not felt. Um, but he was it, was, it was extremely collaborative. You know, he was open. We tried it a couple different ways. There was one point where I was sitting on like the arm of the chair but, or, you know, we tried it a couple of the lap, like it just didn't feel right. I think that we were trying to feel what we were trying to feel and exude familiarity and the power dynamic, and also just give you imagery. Give him, first of all, not so much, it's not so much, we, we were, I felt like we were feeling it inside out. Like, okay, well, we've been together, you know, we would just, we just, felt around it and then we just 
ended up doing what felt the most natural and familiar to us. And I think it just started to slowly morph into what was comfortable because Viola and I got to know each other and hang out and laugh more and we go eat and we went to a theme park. Like then it just sort of naturally found itself anyways because we just, we did become really comfortable with one another. Yeah. And it seems like as a performer that she's someone who just comes in with like really specific choices and, mm -hmm. and knows exactly what it is that she wants. So how did that kind of impact and, and start to influence the way that you were working and, and approaching scenes just from collaborating with her in that way? I mean, she just knew who Ma was and knew what Ma wanted and, you know, wanted to make sure that Ma wasn't, she's not a joke. Like she's a woman that lived and the blues are just symbolic. I, I will, when you think of like, she was a singer, she's a blues singer. Like mm -hmm. the blues is how we process, I think how we started processing our trauma, singing about it, talking about it in a very, you had to be careful about what you sang about back then. Cause you could go to jail. Like if they saw it as propaganda, but the blues was our way of letting it all come out in the wash in a really slow way. Mm -hmm. And I think like, I think Viola just made that the priority of like, I'm a woman that's processing, 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 and I'm trying to, I don't know. I think she took also her real life experiences of like the symbolism of the Coca-Cola, the symbolism of just like, we're gonna start when I say, cause she's been at the mercy of Hollywood and, and white men and white, like she's had to she has been unappreciated for so long or, uh, you know, but knowing that she had a voice and knowing that she had talent and knowing that she is worthy. I think, um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't, I didn't, I just, it was just there. She just, she was honest. I was honest. We would bounce off of one another. And she just, I think she just was honest about her, honest about who Ma was. Yeah. And I love that you were just bringing up, you know, the musicality and, and the music, particularly with the blues, because it almost feels like the dialogue has a musicality to it as well, which is one of the things that I thought was so beautifully crafted, you know, when there's dialogue happening and then all of a sudden it goes into a music performance, it doesn't actually change the rhythm and the pacing. And it feels like there could have been music behind the dialogue all along. So how did that you know, kind of come together, you know, with the way that George was viewing and constructing the film and how did that influence the way that you really worked with the text and worked with the worked with the dialogue and thought about the delivery with that rhythm in mind. That's a really good observation and something George just said this morning on our earlier Zoom about how really August writes like he writes like it's a song. It's it's a, it's we are all the notes and it's just a song. If you really listen to their words, like if you put some music behind it and they were to sing it, you'd be like, wow, you know, mm -hmm. and. Um, just the ethos, the energy of this whole thing is like all predicated on the spirit of it and all about this, uns we're talking about it and then we're not like yeah. the unspoken and then what is said and what we're really saying and what the symbolism of like, I was just saying earlier on another call, like the saddest part to me of this film, one of the saddest beginnings of the film is when, mm -hmm. when, um, when Levy says, I got me some new shoes. Like it's so pure, it's like a child, you know? But like, I, it's like the magnitude of, of just the pride and how hard you have to work to even get the damn shoes and how that's not enough and how it can, it will never be enough and how fleeting that is, but the joy like a child and like those feet were at one point in the field and now you're not in the field anymore, but to be in this world as a black person is still in the field. You know, you still gotta be twice as better and work just as hard, more hard. Like you gotta, it's just, um, it's, all a, it's all a song and all up for interpretation, but August, he kind of leaves, it's so, so much is said that nothing more really needs to be said, but there's so much being said in the unsaid and the in-between and the quiet moments and in, um, you know, Toledo playing the one key, like hitting the key for, like, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, I think some of it is just the spirit of those that we've never heard from, like our ancestors and those that had dreams that we never even knew, you know, we never 
someone that was singing in some random bar in Chicago and someone who sang, but, you know, cleaned for the rest of their lives or, yeah. Yeah. There's also such beautiful intimacy that you managed to capture with Chadwick, with the scenes with Levy, with Levy and the way that, again, you really just kind of capture 10 different layers of what they're thinking within two seconds of them looking at each other across the room. And those moments tell us just as much as the moment where they're kind of like off in a room together, just the two of them, the camera work kind of just keeps circling around them as they continue to circle each other. So I wanted to ask about the way that you kind of use two very different styles of performance and intimacy to really construct that together. I again like you know it's already written and then George we rehearsed it and so by the time we did it on the day it was just really comfortable and it felt like a dance number but also just it's just like bringing it back to yourself like we've all you've we've shared intimate moments with people where you're just so desperate to be loved desperate to be seen desperate to be to be felt and I think it was just Chadwick was just so graceful and humble in his willingness to just give to Levy and therefore give to Dussie and therefore give to Taylor. Like, you know, we were just, he was, um, he was just so present that it was fun. Like we had fun that day. We were cracking jokes, you know, we were, and he was just making sure I was comfortable and like, you know, wanted to try it a different way and made sure I was good with that. And it was just like, I was like, do what Levy does. Cause it felt like in, when, when it felt like we were those people, you know, it was like, we stepped into like somebody else, them. Yeah. yeah. On, on a different note, one of the atmospheric elements of that I thought was really interesting was just that there's this real sense of just like the physical heat that's taking place in the movie as well. You know, you have Mars just sweating profusely the whole time. We see like a tiny fan giving the only airflow within the room. Yeah. So I was, it was interested in how much that impacted some of the choices that you made and, and the way that you just thought about the external element of just like that heat radiating through, through her body throughout the entire movie. Girl, I love how much you're paying attention. It makes me so happy. Cause that's all, that was all so intentional. It wasn't written like that. It wasn't written originally where it takes place in the summer, hot. But George is such a genius that he was like, that's another added element of tension and discomfort and annoying. And you're talking and you need, it's hot as hell. And like, but Ma still has her fur on because, you know, and, and so it, it just, I mean, it, it definitely adds another element of just, it's annoying when it's hot and people are talking and not agreeing and like, and, and we're all hot. Like, I think, every one of those people, you touch one button and they're once, I think we all as humans are one, we're not that far off from one wrong button being pushed to losing it. And I think that there, but theirs is like bubbling, 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 you know, and it's been bubbling for so long because it's so much internalized pain and trauma and wounds and just like uncertainty and you know, it's like we're in the night we're in the 1920s and we are black. Like there's no running from that. You know, you and you just think if I say it this way, if I sing it that way, if I and Ma's like for the sake of her own sanity, for her own preservation, for her own dignity, is going doing everything she can to create um some like create resistance so that she's like to still feel like but I matter and I you wouldn't have anything if I didn't speak but it's just but I think the heat adds like an urgency and a more like the stakes it just feels hotter yeah and then in in terms of a lot of the choices that that you make and the way that you think about them I thought it was so interesting that you've mentioned how George would frequently ask you why you know even when you had a choice, he would ask you why, what's the reason for that? Why would it be this particular way? And did that kind of open up just like a layer that you maybe hadn't even anticipated in terms of the deeper layers that you managed to then deconstruct and really find in terms of your character and, and also in terms of like what you brought in your own performance? 
it's interesting because he didn't he didn't actually say why but he mm. was so brilliant in what he did ask me that even when we called cut and we wrapped or i wrapped rather because i wrapped like a couple weeks before the movie mm. before the band wrapped i was i found myself asking why i found myself mm. feeling like a real human that was like why like what's next for me yeah. for dusty for taylor and yeah. how the like and I hope I never stop asking why. I just, George is just so interested in getting, you can, there's still, it's like this infinite discovery and um, asking the why is kind of the beginning of possibility. If we, if we ask why about the world that we live in today, maybe we have room to answer how in which it can be different. And I think that George, where his art and where he is, those things, he just is walking artist, art. He's just, he cares about figuring out why and how, like, let's, like, let's, let's unpack that. Why? That was what I took. That was kind of my gift, I think, taking from him is like, just when I thought I had her figured out, tomorrow something else came up different for me or what I actually, you know, it's not just like, it's just, she's not just joking and funny and moving her hips around and this sexual, she has dreams and thoughts too. She has yeah. a presence that wants, you know, she's a living and breathing mm -hmm. woman just like everybody else here. Yeah. So. Diving back a little to what you were talking earlier about like the internalization of this character, I was curious about the parallels between that and your work on Zola, because in a very similar way, your performance in Zola is very, is that, you know, again, she's kind of, she's really just trying to observe and survey the situ situation around her and is, is also just like looking for that autonomy for that, that validation in, in certain ways as well. So even though on paper, they're, they're wildly drastically different characters. I was interested in whether there was a parallel in terms of the types of skills that it required of you and, and the type of approach that it, it brought out in terms of thinking about who they were as characters and how you wanted to approach them from such an internalized manner. I think there's definitely always going to be a through line in the characters that, mm -hmm. I, that I want to play and that I think the more I heal my own insecurities, I become more available to them. But where they're different is, yes, they're both trying to survive, but mm -hmm. they're both trying to survive and they're both processing trauma. Mm -hmm. And they're both carrying a lot that you don't see. Mm -hmm. Funny enough though, in Zola, there's like a physical thing that we, we're on the ride, right? And with Dusty, you're, it's a day in the life in this room, but like she has this whole life that exists in her. And with with Zola, she's, um, it's funny, like there's this, there's, she, it's funny, she has like all these bags, like physical, like she has like a bunch of different bags and you'll see Riley with this like little like grocery bag. And I just thought about like how heavy a black woman's bags are and how gaslit you are when you ask for anyone to acknowledge them or help you carry them. And how, no, how most people just don't have to and like don't even know that you have to like unless you are a black woman. Same with, I guess in the same way as with Desi, though you don't hear it or hear from her, she isn't holding in a lot. She's internalizing a lot. She's hoping for a lot. Um, but yes, they are wildly different. But of course, I would think that a Dusty exists inside of Zola. Her ancestors, that energy, the spirit of like, what's it gonna be today? Mm -hmm. Here we go, life. Yeah. Yeah. And and from you know, putting together this performance in in Ma Rainey and and inhabiting this like really, really enriched character. How do you feel that that experience of playing her evolved your work as an actor and, and what are the elements of, of this performance and this character that you feel are really gonna continue to sit with you and, and come into play in, in future projects and characters for you? Um, well, I just felt incredibly, I felt, it's funny because it can be really daunting and really scary to be with all of these, you know, these, these, 
terrific artists who are also theater actors. And one of my biggest regrets is not having moved to New York at 18. And, and even if I didn't go to school there, not having, you know, done some off Broadway first. And instead of going, I, I would have done, I would have, but beginning my 20, early 20s, I would have probably done something different. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of being prepared and being available to myself and not feeling like I'm auditioning for my personality. And, um, but it was interesting. I remember I was actually at Sundance and the casting director of Ma Rainey's assistant came over to me and was like, I just wanted to tell you that we had everyone from Yale to Juilliard to all over wanting this role. And I was so excited that we got you. And like, no offense, like you're really talented, but like, you know, you didn't go to like those schools and like, you didn't really like do theater, but like you really like embodied what we wanted. And I was just so taken aback because George, I like just love George. Like he is just like, and like, he just was going on and on about how he was just so refreshed that someone like George, who's like the, like the elite of this mm -hmm. umbrella of theater and knows his shit was just like, but that's Desi. And I just, what I have learned though, is my experiences and my interests and my, my desire to, to, to remain open to keeping the channel open to expanding to learning to asking questions to reading as much as i can to watching as much as i can to to we have so many resources from youtube to now like all these streaming like there's criterion channel there's so much to absorb that i can stop feeling so guilty about what i didn't do and start looking at what i'm doing by being really intentional about like the life that i'm living and the type of roles that i want to create and be a part of the, the stories I want to be a part of and that I'm right on time and I'm right where I need to be and that wasn't my story but I'm making my own now and I will the right souls always find each other they work together they meet they create they collaborate we see it we see it we know it and you know now George is someone that, like a confidant of mine I reach out we we email we talk on the phone like He's my dog. I went to his birthday party when I was shooting in New York last year. Like I would have probably done it again this year, but COVID. So I'm, you know, I'm in LA, he's there. But now I have this friend that's lived a life that's been wise, that has, that's actually really way more open and not judgy and not like, you know, not like what you, what some people feel he could, what he could be actually. So. Yeah. just take the like relax just relax mm -hmm. humble yourself learn stay open yeah well it's it's such a phenomenal film that really just like transcends itself off of the screen when you watch it and your performance is so stunning and thank you so much for for talking today all about this thank you thank you so much